Welcome to this session of the Plant Cure Summit 2016, co-sponsored by PlantCureFoods.com. Our guest is Dr. John McDougall. Dr. McDougall is a physician and nutrition expert who has been writing, teaching, and speaking out about better health through a plant-based diet for over 30 years. He's the founder and director of the nationally renowned McDougall Program, a 10-day residential program that he and his wife, Mary McDougall, host in Santa Rosa, California. His program not only promotes a broad range of dramatic and lasting health benefits, but most importantly, can also reverse serious illnesses, including high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and others, all without the use of drugs. Welcome to the summit, Dr. McDougall. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I've been at this a long time. Actually, I started uh, medicine in 1968, and probably by 1978, I was a diet doctor. So that, that, that probably dates me to, you know, 40 years of doing this kind of business and uh, 50 years of being in the medical business. So I've, I've learned a few things. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're, you're up there on, on the plant-based Mount Rushmore, you know? <laughs> that's, that's good to think. You know, I, I've got some ideas that are shared by others in terms of food, and they certainly are not original. But I've enjoyed being a doctor. I've enjoyed seeing people who get well. You know, one of the things I really do uh, is I really do see patients. I uh, get a chance to see, oh, let's just guess, uh, 300 a year. And I've probably seen well, no, over 6,000 pe people myself in my career. And it's, it's different than, you know, reading a scientific paper when you have to apply what you know uh, to the patient and make your best guesses. And also when you have to fight a traditional medical training and also a melu in which when you do the wrong thing, in other words, do, don't do the same thing as other doctors, you're at risk for criticism. And of course the risk, worst criticism would be a lawsuit. And I have to tell you, I've been at this uh, now 50 years. And in that 50 years, I've had only one complaint against my practice of medicine. I've never had a lawsuit or a threatened lawsuit. I had one complaint. It was to my medical board, actually not even to the medical board. It was to some industrial service board in Hawaii, which related to my medical board. And it was a complaint that I violated the, uh, uh, the professional information, violated, uh, 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 told things so without consent, violated the HIPAA regulations. And uh, that complaint was originally sent to HIPAA, which is the organization to protect people's uh, privacy. And they turned it down. And so the plaintiff went to uh, the industrial department, which was related to the, my Hawaii medical license, and complained that I violated the uh, uh, medical private history of a man by the name of Robert Atkins. So in other words, Veronica Atkins is the only one who has uh, made a letter of complaint to me in my 50 years of medical practice. <laughs> what she kind of claimed is when I went on, uh, I went on um, uh, several cable stations, I was on the uh, well, front page of the New York Times and so on. What I did is I explained that Dr. Robert Atkins, the famous diet doctor, was uh, sick and overweight, which was common medical knowledge. And the fact that I was willing and able to go on national TV and radio and uh, newspapers and make uh, this particular knowledge available to the public. In other words, they are listening to health tips and weight loss tips by a man dying of heart disease and suffering from obesity. And uh, I thought that was a bit fraudulent. So when I had that opportunity, along with Dean Neil Bernard, I did go out there and uh, the result was I had my one complaint. I guess another point, really the point I'm trying to get across or get to is I really love being a doctor. And I think part of that uh, love of uh, touching patients and healing their problems or he hearing their problems and help them heal their problems has been the greatest joy in my life uh, is to see these more than 6,000 people. And you might think, you know, if you're on the outside of the business, you might think that this gets very boring seeing the same problems over and over and again, uh, same people. But that's the thing, it's not the same problem. And it's not the same person, it's always a challenge. It's just similar to when people ask me, don't you get tired of giving the same lecture over and over again? Well, I've never given the same lecture twice. And I probably given the a lecture with the same title 
you know, a thousand or two thousand times, but it's always been a different audience. Uh, there's always been different vibrations in the room. So my my life as a physician and a teacher has been very, very exciting, extremely rewarding. And uh, without, you know, things like complaints and lawsuits, by and large, people are, I think, are, at least my patients are personally quite happy with what I do. Uh, and I have very few detractors, both on the uh, medical side, which would mean um, uh, you know, other medical doctors or hospitals or licensing boards. And I have uh, very little tractors until recently on the vegan movement side. And, uh, but every once in a while, somebody gets a little riled up because I don't say exactly what they want me to say, or, you know, I can't please everybody, but yeah. a popularity contest has never been in my, in my goals to win. Uh, yeah, I know you, you have uh, spoken, spoken your mind and uh, spoken it fearlessly for, as you say, uh, the, these 40 or 50 years and you've made just a tremendous difference and uh, we're all really grateful for that. Well, I'm glad I made my contribution. I also always give credit to my mentors. If you go to my website, you'll have a, a, a great history lesson about the people that I learned this kind of truth from. People like Dennis Burkett, a very famous, very famous doctor who worked in Uganda, Africa for 17 years, took care of took care of 10 million people and oversaw a thousand hospitals and never saw colon cancer or prostate cancer or type two diabetes or obesity or hemorrhoids or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis. Never saw it among these 10 million people over 17 years. <clears throat> he, he's the guy that opened my eyes. And just like, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, Forks Over Knives and Plant Nation and you know, my other colleagues have been in a position, they had their eyes opened once like I did and now we're able to open the eyes of many other people so that they can see. And once you see, uh, the truth is evident. And I had mentors such as Nathan Pritikin, who was uh, not a doctor, but uh, certainly a very practicing uh, person in the sense of caring for people and also uh, making big publicity out of the movement we have. And uh, Walter Kepner, who did the rice diet, that was a very important person in my life. He treated people well, before I was born with a diet similar to what I use, but even more simple, and got phenomenal results, uh, Dr. Kempter did. And then Roy Swank, we've just been reviewing his stuff because we just published our study on diet and multiple sclerosis. And Roy Swank uh, was my mentor who taught me that uh, diet caused multiple sclerosis and that you could stop it with a good diet. And all of these, by the way, all of these mentors I just talked to you about, if you just go to my website and you put in the search engine their various names, You'll find what uh, my relationship has been with them, and uh, you'll find that some of the things that they've taught me and the, and the uh, shoulders, strong shoulders I stand on. And what we're at a point now is uh, <clears throat> this eye-opening process has gotten bigger with Forks Over Knives and Plant Nation and T. Colin Campbell's work and Ornish and you know, what I've contributed. And we're getting just so many people to understand the truth. Hopefully there won't be a, uh, a backswing, you know, like, like that pendulum is. That happened to me in the 1970s. I thought this was all figured out, you know, that the meat and dairy industry were done, that uh, poor health was a matter of uh, historical record, but I was wrong. The pendulum swung back into the bad health direction. Robert Atkins, I was just talking to you about other low carbers, a uh, big push from the meat, dairy, and egg industry to sell their products, you know, their businesses, that's what they do. And it was unregulated because we're a free country. We have free trade, we have free speech. So was there's uh, basically no one there to protect us in the 80s and 90s and 2000, even 2010. You have no protection from the USDA, the Department of Health and Human Services. You have uh, uh, basically no protection from uh, the various organizations in the medical business like the American Heart Association, or the American Cancer Society. Uh, they won't take up the battle of truth to save you from an unnecessary amputation of your breast or prostate or uh, save your spouse from dying of a heart attack or they won't stand up to tell you what the truth is about food so your children aren't constipated and obese and suffer sometimes from leukemias and lymphomas. They, they just don't have the will to do that. Uh, they should be. And so now we're kind of, uh, as a result of a grassroots movement, 
because government won't do what it's supposed to do. Government is supposed to protect us from foreign, foreign, you know, like Russia and China, foreign and domestic invaders. Yeah, that's what the government does. So, I mean, you can't, you can't hire, hire IBM or Ford Motor Company to build a, an army and a navy. You must have a, a, a U.S. government to protect us from, from foreign threats. And likewise, uh, you can't fight uh, uh, domestic threats with, uh, you know, craft foods or, 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 or by hiring bypass surgeons. You can't do that. You have to have, you have, to have governmental intervention to save the public, and they're just not doing it uh, because business is so big. But getting around to what I really wanted to say and where we, we come together, Lee, is that uh, we have <clears throat> done something that uh, no one ever thought could be done. And that is to open people's eyes, to put business on notice to the point where they're being very aggressive now about selling their products ruthless, you know, and lying as always, uh, buying legislators and buying lobbyists and and so on. They are really afraid of what's going on because of what uh, you and I and uh, the rest of the team have accomplished over the last, well, I've been doing it for 40 and Colin and S have been doing it for 30, Esselstyn. And Bernard's been doing it for about 35. And Ornish has been doing it for about 40 like me. And there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of young doctors in uh, all kinds of fields, dietetics and medical fields, uh, physicians, public health officials, environmentalists, you know, animal rights people, all kinds of folks are standing up and saying, you know what, uh, we can be heard and we can be different. So it's kind of a whole new era now that we're going into in the um, mid 2010s, you know, the, the year being 2016. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. But again, you know, I was absolutely certain back in the 1970s that the pendulum was going to swing to the truth and we were going to save this planet. I was wrong once, I could be wrong twice. And uh, just like this election coming up, <laughs> everybody's got their idea who's going to win. But you better watch your, you know what, because you might be surprised if the other guy or gal wins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got that perspective. You got you that right. You can't let your, your your guard down and have any confidence that you're winning because that's when you lose. Yeah, uh, it, it seems to me that one of the most pressing issues that we're facing now uh, is the environmental issue, uh, and that you know global warming is happening. You know, and it, it it's it's seems to me that uh, adopting a plant based diet is just central to helping to solve that problem. Well, I'm I'm clear on that. Uh, Robert Goodland uh, spoke at our advanced study weekend. He's he's since passed away, but uh, he was one of the the leaders in the movement. He was actually the head of the world. Uh, the World Food Bank at one time, <clears throat> and in charge of the environmental section for the United, United Nations uh, World Health Organization on the, preserving the environment. He spoke, spoke at our weekend, and he clearly said the things that I've been saying and other people have been saying. This, this, uh, food is really the card. It's the, it's the one playing card we have that could make a difference. Uh, we have to do all these other things. We all have to get electric cars and or hydrogen cars, or <clears throat> you have to get uh, our, our energy from other sources. And I think we can do that. I really do. It's just, it's just a, a matter of time. You know, maybe it'll take 30, 40, 50 years, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, what we need to do, the card we need to play right now is the food card. <clears throat> People around the world, including our national leaders, uh, need to stand up and say, it's time to stop eating meat, period. It was just last week the uh, United Nations came out and said that we should put a tax on meat to dramatically reduce the, the uh, consumption of meat. That's what the United Nations said. And we need that kind of, uh, of authority. You know, people stand back and say, you know, they say, well, don't give me this uh, granny state, this, this government uh, intervention in my personal life. Well, excuse me, there is a place for government like the United Nations and the United States and so on. There is a place for these organizations to stop something that appears to be unstoppable. But with the, you know, the declaration last week of the United Nations that we had a heavily, heavily tax uh, uh, meat, particularly red meat, uh, they could come to an awareness 
in six months. It'll take six years. So what we really need to do is go back to a starch-based diet, the traditional diet of people of potatoes and corn and rice and beans. And animal foods should be just abandoned. Like they should, they should uh, have the same classification in a healthy, normal person's life as uh, heroin or tobacco or alcohol or cocaine. And these are things that are not good to, for society. In fact, uh, the impact of food on our world, all the way from an individual to a family, to a community, to a country, to the entire world, the impact of food is far greater than the conglomerate impact of heroin, cocaine, tobacco, alcohol, uh, I don't know what else I could name it in terms of impact on people's and communities' personal health and the impact on the environment. I mean, think about it for a minute. Uh, to grow sugar costs nothing in terms of uh, the environment. Uh, to grow tobacco, heroin, the cocoa plant, alcohol, grains, you know, this is not no negative environmental impact at all. In fact, you could probably argue it's a positive environmental impact. And the amount of death and disability uh, that's done, add all the substances together and uh, match it up against bacon and burgers and cheese, and you have, you have no match at all. Uh, what we're doing with food is far, far more destructive. Uh, healthcare costs, uh, suffering families, and most important, which nobody can deny, this is the, the one factor that is undeniable. I mean, there are still some, some goofballs out there that are global warming deniers, but Otherwise, any sane person understands what's going on, and it doesn't take a big step to realize that food is at least half of the problem and is an immediate overnight solution. That's what's really exciting. If we could get uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister Modi of uh, India, uh, Mr. Putin of Russia, uh, Barack Obama of the U.S., and, and other great leaders, and some of them have, like in the Netherlands, uh, they've taken steps and they've told their population that they have to cut down on their meat intake and the UN did it. And we get all, get all these really, really loud voices, all these megaphones up. This afternoon, say, would be soon enough for me. And they all stood up and they say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, here's a little cartoon we put together about how we're destroying our world and how we can fix it by just making a different choice at the next meal. And not just a meatless Mondays, excuse me. You know, we need to uh, stop this right now, uh, immediately, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And yeah, you have a lot of cattle farmers go out of business, but tobacco farmers going out of business in the U.S. when Surgeon General Luther Terry in 1964 told him tobacco causes lung cancer. I didn't feel sorry for the tobacco farmers. And it's the same thing with you folks out there that are growing, out there that are growing uh, dairy cows and pigs and chickens in whatever manner you're doing it in a, in a uh, kindly manner or cruel manner. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, you need to lose your jobs. Go find something else to do. And uh, let's save the planet for my children and uh, my grandchildren because, you know, there's what I see and what you see and anybody who has their eyes open sees is, is horrifying. So horrifying that we turn our, eye, our eyes away from it. But if we had a, a solution, if we had a, a, a possibility of doing something realistic to give us some breathing room, which would be to change the food, then I think a lot more people would open their eyes and raise their heads and uh, try and stop the confusion and the insanity. Uh, but we have to get this food message out. You can, I don't care how many, how many Teslas Elon Musk makes, uh, it's not gonna solve the problem. No. I don't care how efficient your solar, your solar converters become, it's not gonna solve the problem. You've gotta get the food problem solved because it's at least half of the uh, destruction of this planet is the food. Uh, it it also seems to me, I mean, what's great about a plant-based diet is just by switching to a plant-based diet, you are immediately addressing three concerns, the environmental impact, uh, the, the health uh, impact, and also the humanitarian uh, uh, aspect of it. So just by changing your diet, you're addressing all three of those things. And right. that, that seems to me like it's a win-win-win for everybody. But when you're dealing with uh, the most evil of evil, <laughs> when you fix that and make it good, the impact is huge. 
And you're dealing with the most evil of evil, which is what's going on in the food industry. Uh, killing children, killing children, uh, uh, making a third of our children overweight, 17% obese, uh, making them sit on the toilet for a half an hour, grunting, groaning, straining, and bleeding. Uh, this is criminal behavior. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to stop them. Plain and simple. <laughs> And the bloodier it gets, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I don't gamble blood. Uh, they just don't. Uh, the industries, they, they, they've got it made. They're stuffing gold in their pockets. Uh, they're fighting back the best they can and with lies. Uh, it doesn't matter. And they don't take anybody like uh, Forks Over Knives or myself or PCRM. They, they don't take it serious. What they do is just kind of hope we go away even though lawsuits have been filed and uh, certainly we make our message as public as possible in books and webinars. They just, they just hope that nobody will really notice and they keep, can keep going on with their barbaric behavior, but uh, it has to stop. It'll stop. Yeah. And, and, it, and it is mother nature, as you mentioned, Lee, that's going to do it because she doesn't give a darn about, you know, how big a house you live in or, you know, how, how important you think you are. Mother nature is going to, going to react as she is right now, you know, like with the new Zika virus epidemic and uh, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, world problems we're having uh, because the pressures from nature, because nature is being destroyed. And we're just right now, we've got the 2016 uh, Brazil Olympics. And in Rio, the water, they say, I mean, everybody's heard this, but the water is so polluted, uh, the swimmers are afraid to get in to do their swimming events in the ocean. And, you know, it, uh, the warming is, is huge and the you know, mosquito infest infestations with Zika and dengue and other kinds of diseases are spreading north and south. And we're in a position, actually, in our business plan, uh, we do adventure trips <clears throat> and we take people to Costa Rica and Galapagos and Panama, in fact, we're just planning a trip to the Panama Canal. But uh, looking at uh, the infection problems that are going on and how they are getting so more dense and, and uh, threatening, dengue fever, malaria, Zika, and so on, uh, we, we were really have, gonna have to change our, um, our adventure business and head north instead of south. We took uh, 60 people to Alaska a couple months ago, and we had planned to go to Costa Rica and the Panama Canal, but you know, even if it's even if you can put enough bug spray on, you know, people are afraid to travel. Uh, maybe it's just uh, more hype from the news. Uh, maybe it it is uh, a, lo a lot of real threat to people. Uh, regardless, with global warming, uh, the infectious diseases that were once confined to the tropics are moving uh, to the subtropics and uh, getting to be more and more of a problem. So we likely we've been thinking we were talking last night about taking a trip to Iceland. You know, take an adventure. You know, why not? You know, we, we, we've got to put our time in here and do the best we can. And because uh, uh, Mary and I are not going away for any time soon. And we do these adventure trips. So we're talking about doing Iceland and then going back to Alaska. And we're taking a group to Hawaii here um, January of 2017. But we can't look at, uh, at destinations we used to go to, like Peru and, and uh, Panama and Costa Rica, because of the the fear the world has of, uh, of the changes that have occurred as a consequence of global warming. That's, that's really sad to hear. Uh, uh, but I also, I, I also hear Iceland is a really interesting place. It's uh, like the most volcanically active region on earth or something like that. Is that, is that true? Well, I've been hearing, you know, since we started looking at uh, starting to change our gaze north instead of south, uh, I've just started to become aware of Iceland, and uh, and I've heard it's one of the best best tourist attractions ever. Yes, uh, we certainly had a great time in Alaska two months ago. Uh, I took 62 people uh, on this amazing adventure trip. Uh, I tell you, I did get burned. <clears throat> it was a National Geographic uh, trip, and. Uh, I didn't realize, but when we went on the trip, there was all this, uh, I had been to Alaska three times, 1993, 2001, and then here in 2016. And of course, I was very interested in the maps they showed of glacier change uh, melting. And I'd seen just, a, you know, the glacier had melted, the glaciers had melted miles. The ice masses maybe, let me guess, maybe it's a 
two thirds of what it was or less than when I went there the first time. And the interesting thing is they did not uh, talk once about global warming, the guides didn't. They talked about recession and advance of glaciers and so on. And I'm sitting there thinking, why aren't you bringing this up? And it's because uh, National Geographic was bought out by Fox, uh, a guy named Murdoch, and he's a global warming denier. And uh, I have to believe that, uh, and I didn't know this before the trip, and if, if I would have known this and this would have got out to my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, followers so that a uh, right-wing global warming denier owned uh, the company that we took the trip on, uh, I would have expected some cancellations. But anyway, that's over. Uh, I learned a lesson there, and we are going to check care more carefully check uh, the uh, financial support of any tour companies that we hire in the future. And we will not be going to that back to that tour company. And we told them, and we told them why. And they said, yeah, well, we realize we have a few problems with our leaders thinking. You know, you really do. And somebody's got to stand up to these global warming deniers. And we did. They lost a half a million dollars, at least from us. Uh, uh, well, I am – actually, that's uh, shocking news to me that uh, Fox bought out uh, – you know, National Geographic is an institution, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always expected to get – the straight story from them. And they, it seems to me like in, in times past, they have really been on the cutting edge of things about like, uh, you know, animals going extinct and things of that nature. Uh, but to hear that, that they do not embrace the idea of global warming, I think is... Uh, well, their, their leader doesn't. Yeah. Their, leader, their, their leadership does not. I'm sure the guys were well aware uh, you'd have to be blind and dumb not to be aware of uh, what's going on. Uh, I'm sure they were well aware. I, I, I would have no doubt, like in any company, you must be very careful about what you say uh, in order to keep your job. And so the guides were phenomenal. The trip was amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing trip. But when I got home, I wrote a newsletter. Uh, probably two months ago, it's no newsletter. And then I, I talked about the wonderful trip we had, and I just couldn't understand how no one was talking about global warming. And uh, some of my listeners wrote back to me and said, well, this is, uh, you did realize in 2008 uh, that the Fox, you know, Fox News, Fox Company, Murdoch, uh, they bought out National Geographic. And I started looking back through their articles, and I found, when I wrote the original newsletter, a very positive article about uh, about global warming, how we have to be so careful, but that was before the buyout. Since the buyout, and I haven't done a thorough study, uh, but uh, my guess is since the buyout, you will find very few articles uh, condemning man <clears throat> for causing global warming, and uh, I'd be real surprised, and you can prove me wrong, I haven't done a study on it, I'd be real surprised if they did a study on how, or an article about how, um, changing the kind of diet that we recommend would make a difference. You know, as I say that, actually, Lee, I think back that maybe they did. Maybe they did. But anyway, I just felt that uh, that, that, that kind of uh, global warming denying philosophy uh, was uh, hanging over an otherwise absolutely phenomenal trip. But when we go back to Alaska, we'll go with another company. Uh, how big a force is, uh, is global warming uh, denial now? Or it, it seems to me that it's like the, the deniers are kind of an endangered species, but is that not the case? Well, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on that either, but I do know that a uh, that, uh, guy named Murdoch and, and uh, a lot of the other very wealthy people in this country, <clears throat> they have very good reason to be global warming deniers. And because their their businesses depend upon doing activities that warm the globe, you know why would they not? Yeah. You know they don't want to put it out, they don't want to put out the the, the coal industry and uh, change anything else because they're just raking in tens of billions of dollars and you know that's their moral code is to make as much money as you can. I have to guess because they're certainly not doing the right thing. Now there are exceptions uh, like Bloomberg that uh, comes to mind and. And there are other, there are some multi, multi-billionaires in this world. 
that do understand what's happening, do, do, do understand what needs to be done. <clears throat> but there are just too many out there with money and power and control of the media that can put doubt in people's minds. You just need doubt. Just a little doubt uh, to allow these uh, destructive things to go on. Yeah. For example, you just uh, a cigarette smoker needs to just have a little doubt that it really does cause lung cancer. And the same thing with global warming, you just must have, must have a little doubt in your mind that it's not main man, man activity. You, you really can't do anything about it. You don't have to have proof, just doubt. And that's what PRO does. Uh, so it seems to me there's been some recent studies that have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, very beneficial uh, or touting the benefits of a, a plant-based diet. I'm thinking specifically about the Harvard School of Public Health uh, study. Do, do you know anything? I mean, you, you well, I, I think I heard about one, one of Walter Willard's studies that shows that vegetable protein is better than animal protein. As they, those usually come out from Walter, uh, Walter Willett and a fellow named Hugh. And uh, I, I think, you know, they're kind of in, in our direction, but I wouldn't uh, consider them uh, fully on board with what we believe. Uh, they're very much against dairy. And uh, I've known Walter Willett in a very casual way. I mean, I've just met him a couple of times. Over the years, I followed his research. Uh, he happened to have a great opportunity uh, to do these uh, Harvard studies and uh, published a lot of data. But unfortunately, he didn't have a strong enough bias in my direction to publish the data that I think should have been published. I mean, that was his bias. Uh, literature is always biased. So yeah, there are studies. We came out with two studies this last two years. We came out with one on 1,615 of my patients, which was published in Nutrition Journal, which showed an average weight loss of 3.1 pounds in seven days, eating as much food as you want. We showed uh, a drop in cholesterol of 22 points, 22 milligrams per deciliter in seven days, no medication changes. So we dropped blood pressures, I think 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury. We were able to stop uh, nearly 90% of the blood pressure and diabetic medication, type two diabetic medication, nearly 90% and other drugs too. That was our short-term study. And then we just a couple of weeks ago got our long-term study published out from Oregon Health and Science University, their neurology department. They did a one-year study, randomized, uh, rated blinded, you know, the highest quality study you can do. I was completely uninvolved in anything but the education. They did all the analysis, all the data collection. And uh, this study showed that people would follow the diet that uh, I recommend. Uh, they came to my clinic. That's how they learned it. They certainly learned it well there, maybe better than doing it from a book. But I, I know tens of thousands of people have done the same thing from reading the website and, and reading the book. So what they found was that um, they over a year course with very careful food frequency questionnaires, <clears throat> very carefully designed uh, questionnaires we put together, is we found that 85% of the people, I mean, maybe I wasn't clear about that. Let me say that again. 85% of the people followed the diet we taught them 100% of the time for a year. <clears throat> so this proves with, uh, beyond a doubt that people will do what we suggest. You know, the, the, the first development of ideas, people say it's not true. And we're past that point. We know it's true now. And the, the low carbers, they're, they're dying like they should. And the paleo people, they're dying like they should. Uh, the, 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 the education of what you call a plant food-based diet, and I call a starch-based diet, we are winning. So no one doubts the truth. And the next thing they say is, well, it may be true, but nobody will do it. It's not important. And so we proved that people will do it. 85% of the people uh, stayed on the diet 100% of the time for a year. And that means permanent change. And we also uh, attained a, about a 20-pound weight loss and a 20-point drop in cholesterol maintained for one year. Uh, so that was on our Ohio, our, excuse me, our Ohio, our Oregon Health and Science University study that was just published in a neurology journal. You can find this easy just by going to Google and putting in my name and say OHSU and diet and MS. So, you know, there, there are some good studies from us coming out too. Uh, tell me about... Uh, uh 
plant-based diet and multiple sclerosis. I think that's a really exciting development. Oh, it is exciting. It's, it's very important. It came from one of my mentors. I was in a residency training. So that was probably 1976. And I was on the neurology service and I already had this great interest in nutrition because of my plantation years where I was a plantation doctor. Many of you know that story where I took care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans and found my first generation living on rice, mainly rice and some vegetables, no dairy, little meat. They were always trim, healthy, no breast, colon, prostate, cancer, MS, arthritis, etc. Lived into their 80s and 90s in good health. The kids were born in Hawaii rather than the Philippines. The kids, uh, they uh, soon uh, acquired a taste for the American diet and got fatter and sicker. So I'd had that personal experience, and uh, then I went back into the residency, and then my allegiance was always to food after that, but I had to learn how to be an internist and to know everything that every other doctor knows, and I do, in the sense that I'm a board-certified internist. <clears throat> well, one of my rotations was on neurology, and I was asked to present uh, grand rounds on neurology on topic. Because of my interest in uh, food, I went to the library. And back then, we used to search the library with uh, something called Medicus Index, which are like big dictionaries. Uh, anyway, I uh, learned how to use Medicus Index really well. No computers at that time. And I, I was able to find, to find Dr. Roy Swank. And Dr. Swank, uh, he did his work in uh, Europe during World War II. His job was to, to, to he was an epidemiologist, so to speak. His job was to find disease patterns throughout the world, and in particular in Western Europe, and, and to see what happened to disease patterns during the war in Western Europe. And what he found is heart disease virtually disappeared during the war years. Of diabetes, diabetes new, new cases became rare. Complications type 2 diabetes virtually disappeared. And he also found that multiple sclerosis, new, new cases stopped occurring, and those who had MS, they stopped having attacks. And this was at a time of terrible stress. I mean, you have Nazi Germans killing you and incarcerating you, and I just can't imagine a more stressful time. And uh, those people in school who taught me stress was the trigger for disease uh, certainly didn't take into account that particular scenario. Uh, yet he found all these common diseases to become rare. And... Uh, he took that information after World War II back to uh, Montreal and uh, started a job at uh, the Montreal Neurologic Institute. And he worked there for several years and he started applying what he learned and started taking his MS patients and treating them with a good diet and they seemed to get better. In fact, he published a study in 1991 in the Lancet Journal about how much better these patients got that had MS. <clears throat> Those from, uh, from that he studied in Montreal. And then he was hired at OHSU, and he became the head of the Department of Neurology there for 23 years. And he took care of uh, nearly 5,000 people with MS. And you can find interviews. In fact, I just put up a new interview that uh, the Swank Institute allowed me to use. You find interviews where Dr. Swank will tell you clearly MS is a diet of the Western eating, particularly animals, eating animals. Uh, you could see this because it only occurred, or its distribution was clearly tied to saturated fat intake, which is animal food intake. So he had, and uh, other, other investigators have the uh, epidemiologic data that shows where people eat animal foods, they get multiple sclerosis, and where they don't, they don't. So I told me he went to China one time at the invitation of the head of China uh, to see their neurologic patients. And um, this was in the early 80s. And <clears throat> The uh, doctors there paraded out five patients with multiple sclerosis. And Dr. Swank, he looked them over, he says to me, and I have this recorded, by the way, this discussion. He says to me, he says, I didn't even think they had MS on <laughs> all of China. And of course, in the U.S., you have 350,000 cases of U.S. of MS. Well, anyway, he, uh, he started treating uh, uh, people with a good diet and he published in all our major journals the effect of a healthy diet, which basically stops multiple sclerosis. So out of that, we started the study at OHSU. We proved a lot of important things, but you know, I only had $700,000. Actually, I probably spent a million, but only $700,000 because I got some deals. Uh, with that kind of money, we could only buy uh, 
uh, enough materials to study a little over 60 people. But what we really need, and I'm, I'm never going to gather it, somebody else might want to do it, what we really need is we need like $7 million uh, to show the kind of results that uh, you would get with a good diet. But we showed some pretty dramatic things in this study. So my, Dr. Swank, uh, he was one of my mentors, as the other ones I mentioned, the men who stands, whose shoulders I stand on. There, you know, it's not a gender issue. There just were no women uh, that uh, formed a basic part, because there just weren't any, of, uh, of my fundamental understanding of medicine and or nutrition. Yeah. So uh, are you optimistic about the long-term future of plant-based nutrition in America or the world? I am. I am, and for, for several reasons. Uh, Number one is, you know, people I think generally are good and want to do the right thing. And what they need to do is they need to have the right information. And when people discover what you and I know and the other folks in our movement, I mean, our eyes are open. No, no one is ever going to turn around and say, oh, sorry, we had it wrong. So more and more people are discovering what the truth is, that the, is that the human being is a starch eater. Uh, I kind of own that word in a sense that I a sacrifice. I've thrown myself on the sword for that word, because I believe it's so important that people uh, know that we are starch eaters. We're not broccoli eaters. You know, we're not, uh, not apple eaters. Uh, we are starch eaters, and we always have been, with few exceptions at the extremes of the environment. Uh, we live basically on rice, wheat, barley, potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, corn. Corn's been a big, big uh, part of the diet for human beings. I used to say that there were 10 billion people who walked planet Earth, and I had a professor correct me. It's, it's, it's so good when you put yourself out there and try and tell people what you think you know, and then they come back and tell you that they know a little bit better about some subjects, and I like that. And so there was a professor a few years back that actually tried to calculate how many people have walked on planet Earth, and his calculations are 100 billion. And if you think about that, of those 100 billion people, they're all hunter gatherers. But the emphasis was on gathering with, with few exceptions because, uh, because hunting is so unpredictable, meat's so unpredictable, except if you're in a place like um, up in Alaska with the Inuit Eskimos. Uh, generally in the world, hunting uh, is uh, just a true and reliable source, but it's the thing that men did. It, it's a, uh, it's a, sex, a sexist issue. Uh, just like pretty much everything else in society today is a sexist issue. And so with the sexism that went on, uh, with the food stores, uh, it was the grandparents and women and children who have always been the gatherers and, and the glory hunters, you know, the men who grab their spears and go out on a two week search and comes back with nothing or half rotten carcass. Uh, they're the ones that got all the glory. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're starch eaters. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it always, it seems to me that, to terming our ancestors hunter-gatherers, they got it exactly backwards. They ought to be called gatherer-hunters because clearly gathering was provided uh, the substantial amount of the calories that they consumed. And for the reasons that you said, uh, hunting is unreliable, it's difficult. Uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not easy to catch an antelope or in the older days to kill a mastodon. I mean, that just doesn't, you just don't do that every day. So you got to, <laughs> you know, you got to depend on as your maker food source. <clears throat> and, then throw them in the, and then throw them in the pickup truck and take them home, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, and the, the other thing that people ought to think about, because most of your audience is into the plant food-based movement, is that there are only certain kinds of plants that can be reliable sources of calories. And those plants are known as starches. Uh, they uh, can be gathered seasonally, and they can be stored for decades. Uh, for example, you all know that you can store potatoes in a cool, dry place for, for months. And you can store grains, you know, particularly corn and rice that have been stored for decades for future use. You can't store bananas. Uh, you can't store kale. Uh, maybe you can if you dried it. But there are not very many uh, calories in kale. Uh, the tomatoes rot. I suppose you could dry them, but you know, it's, it's just difficult. 
they're just there's a certain kind of plant food that has always been the center of calories and that uh, uh, that uh, category of plant food is starch the the very foods that people vilify and uh, are afraid to eat because they'll make them fat whereas the scientific nutritional historical truth is exactly the opposite you are a starch eater uh, when you eat a starch-based diet then you got your health back you have control until you do you know you're you're out of control. If you think you can live on kale and lettuce and broccoli and cauliflower, you'll starve to death. Uh, you might make it as a fruitarian for a while. Yeah, there aren't many of those either. So you really have to get uh, the focus of attention, as you know well I do. Every chance I get, I get people to start thinking in terms of meals of, uh, of beans and rice and kale or, uh, or sweet potatoes and broccoli. Uh, very basic, simple eating. People love to eat simple. You know, add your favorite spices, maybe a little salt to the food to make it taste good. And that's what you eat. We're going to, tonight, we're going to have the same dinner that we have probably four nights a week. Uh, some variation. Mary, Mary's got a crock pot already out. I saw it out this morning. And uh, she'll throw in some variation of uh, beans that she likes. And she collects all these different kinds of dried beans in the supermarkets. So she'll pick one of those varieties and she'll throw in... Uh, uh, some new potatoes, or actually she'll cook the new potatoes separate and, and boil them up. And in the beans will go uh, all, the, I've got kale growing in my garden. I've got uh, dried tomatoes already ready. And she'll cut a few of those and throw them up in there. And throw, have to throw them up. <laughs> uh, throw them into the pot. <laughs> and, uh, we'll have, uh, that's what we eat. We'll have uh, new potatoes. And I'll eat a bowl. I'll eat a bowl. You know, like I'll eat two bowls. You see me two bowls this big. And maybe I'll have some whole wheat bread with it too. Don't need to, won't unless it's fresh bread that we got at a market we think get particularly tasty, healthy bread at. And that's the kind of eating that people should do. You know, big bowl of bean soup or bean stew, have it with some rice, have it with some potatoes, and uh, get on with your life. Yeah, there are societies that, well, as you know, I mean, that uh, the Incas lived on potatoes and virtually uh, ex uh, exclusively. And they, did. they survived very, very well for uh, many, many uh, centuries. And, uh, <laughs> and then when the potato was introduced in Ireland, I, I've heard, uh, I don't know if this is absolutely true or not, but that you can support a family of four on the calories uh, on the potatoes that you can grow in a quarter acre. Of yeah, I, I've, I've heard something like that too. I actually have six books, six books on potatoes, <laughs> and they, they all, of course, uh, honor the potato, because when the potato was introduced into uh, Western Europe in the 1700s, it uh, it uh, eliminated uh, starvation. Uh, it changed the entire uh, the entire outlook of the nations and people and their health. Uh, malnutrition disappeared. One of was introduced into Ireland by uh, the Irish population, which I believe was the early 1800s. In 40 years, it doubled, the population doubled because of the abundance of food. So potato is a worldwide savior. And it may be in the future too, actually the World Health Organization in 2008 named uh, the year 2008, the International Year of the Potato. With the idea of food security, that uh, the time may be coming, and we, this gets back to what we said, you know, do I see things changing? And I was going to say I see them changing because of the miraculous uh, communication we have. You know, everybody's got a micro device or a computer. <clears throat> but, you know, I have to tell you, Lee, uh, I, I can't let my guard down there either. I had a talk radio show that was the uh, between number one and number seven all over the West Coast. <clears throat> I was on KABC, the biggest stations. And I was syndicated, I'd get 2,000 phone calls a night. I thought for sure talk radio was gonna save the world because we could get the truth out to people. But what happened uh, in the uh, mid 90s, late 90s is uh, four broadcast companies, leaning by the way, right wing, uh, they went and they bought all the radio stations. So there's four syndicated, there are a few independents, but not many anymore, four that's syndicate uh, radio and other communications all over the world. So they've been basically bought in that, that way of, uh, of, uh, of free enterprise and education. 
And now that we have left is we have the internet and everybody says, oh, well, you know, the internet is free and unrestricted and we get the truth out. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let my guard down. I, uh, I have every reason to believe that the internet will be uh, brought in line too. And then you and I won't be able to have conversations like we're having right now. But as long as we keep the truth out with the internet, we have a chance of uh, continuing to grow and to continue to win the battle for us and the planet Earth. The other thing is, in addition to us acting wisely as human beings, which we have been occasionally known to do, uh, the other thing is that nature doesn't care, as I said. You know, global temperatures have gone up six, six degrees in the uh, polar regions, and <clears throat> the water levels are rising, and Zika viruses are spreading, and you know, uh, nature doesn't care. And so uh, uh, regardless of whether we wish or don't wish to have certain changes made, they will occur. And we just need to be in a position where we can respond. And the first thing we have to do is get the food fixed. Second thing we got to do is we're going to stop having so many people on planet Earth. I'm, I'm not going to go into that but I'm, because I'm sure I offend a lot of people. But I've got some thoughts on how to how to slow the growth of the world's population. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that's a, a big issue, especially with, you know, the, the worldwide water crisis, uh, you know, people lacking clean water. Well, there's, there's just so much fresh water in the world, and there always has been a fixed amount, you know, forever and ever. Uh, well, there's less now. Yeah, and so it seems to me the yeah. only way that you're really going to solve that problem is by cutting down the amount of people that need to use fresh water. You know, I don't, I don't see a, I don't see a big other way, any other huge way of fixing that problem. Well, you know, I, I read about this in the Starch Solution book. I said, you know, there are ways we can reduce the population. You know, one is to have a all out war. <laughs> and, you know, the other is to have, uh, you know, some type of swine something flu vac, uh, uh, infection go through the population, just call a population. When we were on our trip to Alaska, <clears throat> the guides talked about uh, certain populations of, uh, of the uh, Inuit Eskimo in that region and how stories were written about them. And they also talked about, uh, they also talked about the uh, Native Americans uh, in the plains of the United States and how there were big stories and reports of how the uh, white man came into their communities and 80% of the population died from things like measles, smallpox, and so on. 80% of the population died. And this is within almost memorable history. This is within the time that my great grandmother was alive. 80% of the population died. So, you know, the, the, the idea that something will come, Zika probably not, I don't know what it would be called. It comes through and calls out 80% of the population on the planet. Would be, it should be of no surprise to anybody. Uh, so there are a couple of ways that we can deal with that not we, but that the population may be dealt with, or we could do it as uh, intelligent human beings uh, by making policies. And again, I, I, I risk people becoming sensitive for their religious beliefs, or you know they think this is some my some my kind of campaign. But uh, you know, China has done an effective way of limiting their population. <clears throat> by their one-child policy. Not that I'm advocating it. I'm just saying it has been done. Uh, birth control has been made uh, uh, more widely available in the U.S. and across the world. Not saying I'm advocating it, but it's, it's been done. You know, so there are ways that we can, we can determine our future. We're human beings. You know, we have, uh, we have great possibilities if we could just get out of our way and we could get ourselves going in the right direction. We have a planet that could be saved. Uh, Elon Musk and uh, some of the eight rather great thinkers in the world. I'm trying to think of a really smart guy in the wheelchair. What's his name? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. There you go. Thank you. I had this man laughs. Uh, you know, they think the only way the, uh, the human species will be saved is to get off the planet. Well, uh... I hope they're wrong. You know what? There's not room enough in that spaceship for you and your kids and me and my kids. So somebody's staying home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, we, we just, that can't be the, uh, 
you know, that, that can't be the, our limitations as people. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we got to, we got to find a solution. And, you know, to me, the solution is right in front of us. It's on our plates. And uh, that's, you know, if we all sort of embrace that, that would go a long way, I think, towards solving some of these problems. But certainly, doctor, you have been on the cutting edge and the forefront of this for, as you say, 30, 40 years. And uh, it's because of people like you that um, this idea has really taken hold. And I really uh, take my hat off to you for that. And I want to thank you very much for being part of this summit and taking your valuable time to speak with me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, well I appreciate the opportunity, Lee. We didn't even get into what I do as a doctor. You know, we got, we got into areas that I probably shouldn't even be talking about, but they're the ones that are most dear to me because, you know, my life is pretty much, you know, I'm nearly 70 years old and, and I've had a good life, uh, but I've got uh, seven grandchildren and talk to you about how uh, we can cure type two diabetes and stop multiple sclerosis and, you know, halt, halt and slow cancers and reverse heart disease. I've been talking about that for 30 or 40 years. It's important. It's all there. You can read it. But what is my real interest? You know, my real interest is in what we can do for the, the really important picture. And that is, as I know, that forks over knives and, you know, most environmental organizations should be, but many of them are fronts for industry. <clears throat> you know, most people should be uh, focusing all their attention on saving our home. Yeah. yeah. Well, doctor, thank you again. And uh, is there uh, a website that people can uh, oh, please? There's a, there's a website. You know that, Lee. There is a website that is a, a complete, uh, it's a gift. It's a gift that Mary and I give to you because we've been given so many gifts in life. Uh, it's called drmcdougall.com, and you will go there and you'll find five, 600 free recipes. You'll find articles that I write every month on various topics, including the last one was that I did on colon cancer detection methods like colonoscopy and why not to. Uh, uh, <clears throat> all kinds of articles. I've written you know, hundreds of articles, big articles, some that have been turned into books. My free recipes, there are webinars that I do once a week that are there. I or one of my staff does. They're all free. Everything's free. You walk away from there, you say, where's the gimmick? You know, because everything's free. And we do sell some books, and I have a new, new book coming out in September. Uh, we also don't take you to Alaska or to uh, Kauai for free. <laughs> we don't take you to my 10-day clinic for free. I mean, there's certain things we can't do. We can't do. Obviously, we have to run a business. But if you're just talking about pure information that nothing held back, all the instruction, if you put the time in there, and hundreds of thousands of people have done this. You know, we're not talking about uh, the 6,000 that have been through my clinic. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people just gone to the website and uh, gotten the information. And it's interesting, many of them have gotten to me, and I'm sure have gotten to you uh, through the same kind of cross interaction. I have people all the time say, well, I discovered uh, uh, Plant Nation, and I discovered Forks Over Knives, and then I kept browsing around and I discovered Esselstyn and then I found your website and we have, we have this whole team uh, of people that are uh, that are forming a network so one plus something kind of, kind of falls in our web we got them <laughs> they, they, just, they just can't believe it how did all this information all this truth exist and I didn't know it and I was suffering so much with sickness and uh like personal appearance problems and and I didn't know and it was right here and it's not just McDougal that knows it it's it's Bernard that knows it and it's uh it's uh the Esselstyn family that knows it and you know it's just so many people know it and now you know, they feel like they fell into heaven <laughs> and, and you can imagine how good that makes us feel doesn't it yeah no kidding uh, I'm uh, honored to be a very tiny part of uh, the people that are on your team. Well, you know, don't don't minimize that, Lee. After all, you did forks over knives. Well, I, I did it with that. And that that is that you and Brian and the rest of the team, with that little bit of documentary, you changed the world. 
and there's just no denying that that was a that was a uh, piece that is uh, it's persistent now. What six, seven years, eight years? Yeah. It's been on, and it's still talked about. It. Well, half the patients come and see me and say, "Well, you know, it was forks over knives. You know, it was, it was a big step, or my start, or my finish, or whatever. Forks over that is that movie." Everybody said, oh, I passed that documentary out. So uh, I don't want anybody to miss the large contribution that you personally and uh, the rest of the team that worked on that documentary did. Well, thank you again, doctor. And uh, for everybody else out there, thanks for watching. And we encourage you to learn more about our efforts to build a plant pure nation at our website, plantpurenation.com. Thanks again, doctor. Thank you. Thank you.